Hello everyone! I hope you already saw yesterday's video where I update you about the Smash Z up to now. You're going to want to see that because today we're going to talk about their exhibit at Tokyo Game Show. They showed up to the expo without a working unit despite promising their backers that they would. And today I'm going to show you how they built it. Now according to Smash they would have had a working unit there, but they have a technical problem getting video onto their screen. But aside from that, at first glance the unit doesn't look too bad. And a few articles written about the show said the same. However, we had one of our own at the scene. Yes, I have a fan in Tokyo who volunteered to go examine the unit for us. And I'm very thankful that he did because he provides us with some clues that help us uncover what's really going on here. The first thing he wanted to tell us about is the screen. He was adamant that Smash is not using a real screen. He said it seems to be some sort of plastic sheet. And he tells us that he did notice a weird curvature that would happen at the top, which is something Samsung phones have, but not the Smash Z. And I agree with him. I noticed in the pictures he took, it seems that the screen bows in the middle and it's attached at the corners, which of course is not how an LCD is supposed to work. He also shows us that the face buttons were crooked, and I noticed that they seem to sit really low. They're pretty much unusable. I also noticed in all the pictures that the analog stick is really bulby around the base. It's very swollen. And according to our source, it has a bad habit of sticking. It doesn't center. Unless this match Z is taking after the Atari 5200, something's going on here. Another thing we see here is that the start and select buttons are slightly off. One is higher than the other. Also, the power button is protruding further than it should. These are all clues that we'll come back to later. And you should be aware by now, like any good tweaker, I take apart and fix a lot of controllers and handhelds. And because I've acquired this forbidden knowledge, I see telltale signs of how they made this device. And rather than just tell you how they made it, I'm going to show you how. And I'll be doing it using a game stick controller, just so you could be sure that nothing of value was lost for this demonstration. Now as you can see here, the game stick is just like any other controller you own. In fact, it gives the Smash Z a run for its money. The analog stick moves freely and it self-centers. The buttons are at an appropriate height, just like the Smash Z intends to, and the start and select buttons work and are even with each other. So, where am I going with this? Well, this device still has its PCB. The analog sticks are mounted directly to the PCB, and the buttons sit on rubber membranes, which then rests on the PCB. That's how analog sticks and face buttons are supported in just about every device out there today. So, what if we didn't have a PCB under there? Well, we need to support those buttons somehow. But we can't use glue because that would just make the buttons as hard as concrete. So we need something more flexible, and I think I found the right material. And that is... tape. It holds the buttons in place so they don't fall in, while allowing them to spring on the tape kind of like a trampoline. And hey, look at that! Now the buttons are staying lower than they should have because they're resting on the tape. And now let's break off an analog stick and secure it. Hmm, now I could swear I've seen that bulby shape before. Now that we fasten it from the bottom, the analog stick is bulging out just like we saw in the Smash Z. And what happens when we move it? <gasps> Dios mío! It sticks because it's pressing up against the housing. This also explains why the power button is sticking out further than we've seen before, because it's secured to the casing instead of resting on the PCB. And the same goes for the start and select buttons. That is one of the easiest indicators that there's no PCB underneath and they're using tape. Think about it, have you ever had one side of a Game Boy start and select button collapse? It's nearly impossible because the mechanism is so simple. It's just a one-piece design that sits on the PCB. But if you don't have a board underneath and you secure it to the case with tape, then one side can come undone and leave the other side hanging. That's how you get the uneven look that you see here. And just in case you guys need one more smoking gun, take a look at this photo. You can actually see tape residue on the unit. And that's how you con people at Tokyo Game Show! Backers, I have a serious question for you. Are you just fucking cucks? Okay, no, 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 I got a real question here, real question. Did none of you ask Smash to disassemble the unit they brought? You guys do know they don't have the best track record with the truth, right? See, you guys bring this on yourselves because you're not asking Smash to show their work. You're sheep. How many times have we busted them at an expo doing shady shit? And why do they have to resort to these tactics again? I thought they said the device was almost out. That's not a rhetorical question. I really do wonder because let's go back to E3. They had that unit being fed by a laptop, but it had working controls. You can clearly see the PCB is there. Even the analog isn't sticking. So why didn't they bring an improved version of that to Tokyo? Well, it's because what you saw at E3 was not a final case. In fact, that one looked like fucking shit. So you see, something's stopping them from putting all the pieces together. I'm no expert, but I am a hardware junkie, so I have a theory on what's going on here. 
I think the casing and the PCB team are not talking to each other. I don't mean there's bad blood between them or anything. I just mean there simply isn't communication. Each side has their own set of instructions for how to complete their end of the work, but because they don't talk, the finished pieces aren't lining up. It's like trying to give someone a haircut over the phone. It's very hard to get the desired result unless you're in the same room. And speaking of that final casing, they're real proud of it, but you better hope that's not the final product because they forgot the port for the microSD card. Congratulations, Smash. One of the simplest things in your design, and you managed to fuck it up. The earlier mockups all had it, so where did it go? Is the SD reader still going to be on the board? Does that mean people are only able to change out the SD card by disassembling the whole thing? And that is not an easy problem to correct, and I'll tell you why. You might be thinking, oh well, no biggie, they'll just cut another hole in the mold and I'll fix it. But no, that's not how it works. You have to remember that the mold is a negative of the plastic it produces. So if you were to take away more metal, you would end up with more plastic on the case. So the only way to fix the mold is to add metal and reshape it again, which is not at all easy. And for something relatively small like this, which already has a carefully detailed surface, it is likely to be impossible to fix the existing mold at this point. So what solution is left? Throw it away and start all over again. And these molds are not cheap. They cost tens of thousands of dollars to make. Good work, Smash. Keep it up. But hey, what do I know? You don't have to listen to me. I'm just a guy who gets proven right time and time again. And maybe I'm not the only one who's been right about a few things. Allow me to read you this quote. <clears throat> Based on our experience developing and making products, we consider that Smash Z has not been able to understand or value the complexity of development and fabrication that this kind of product implies. That quote comes from their old partner who left them last year. Kinda sounds like a prophecy now, don't you think? Do you guys realize that if Smash was to conduct a legitimate Kickstarter campaign, they would almost be at the point now where they could start asking for people's money? All of this nonsense with the PCB and the video out problems? That's all shit the backers should never have been on the hook for. They presented this campaign to you under the lie that they had all this sorted out. Backers, didn't they tell you earlier this year that they would start shipping in September or something? On what planet were they going to start shipping this year? They don't even have a working prototype. Please, think about this for a minute. How could they set up the factory, train the assembly line workers, and QA test when they don't even have a finished example to work off of? The answer is simple. They lied. Is there any other excuse? They brought another company's gaming laptop to E3, they skipped Gamescom because they had made absolutely no progress since then, and at Tokyo Game Show they brought a plastic shell held together with tape. Yeah, that really shows us they have a production-ready device, right? They told you it would start shipping in 2018 because it was a nice thing to say. Especially when they're selling pre-orders. And they knew it wasn't true, it had no basis in reality. But it would keep your hopes up, and it probably shut you up for a while too. And just for the record, they have quietly moved the delivery date to 2019. If it ever gets that far. What does the future hold for the Smash Z? We'll have to wait and see. But I know one thing for damn sure. Don't expect to find the answer at their expo booths. That's all I have for today. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next time.